I am a kingdom star. I was called to reign on now. Ministry in the world of life. To the weak to give them strength. Hello viewers, my name is Dr. Omoni Yadi. I want to introduce to you this wonderful program powered by Ubongo TV. It is tagged Kingdom Star. Yes, Kingdom Star. On this show, you have the opportunity of meeting people who have labored in the vineyard, who have one experience or the other to share with us. Experience that will be meaningful, experience that we can learn from. Different set of people. This is our maiden edition, and uh, the man of God on this show today is no other person but a man of God who has served God in the area of drama ministry, an evangelist, a trusted man of God, Kolade Shebonkewo. Coincidentally, he's celebrating his birthday. So. KSO, I wish you a happy birthday as you celebrate this year, as you celebrate your 50 years birthday on heart. God will grant you greater grace. You will live long, you will live in peace, and the presence of God will not depart from you for once. Congratulations. So viewers, please sit back, watch this interview. You will enjoy it. Do remember to subscribe and click the notification bell. Please. Thank you. I am a kingdom star. I was called to reign on now. Ministry in the world of life. To the weak to give them strength. To the blind to make them see. Through Christ who strengthened me. Um, I grew up in the Mako area of Shagamu in Ogun State. My childhood was um, basically with my mother who as a civil servant had to move from one part of Ogun State to another. So my growing up was not only limited to Mako Shagamu but was also extended to uh, various parts of Ogun State. Anytime my mother, who was a matron in the Ogun State Civil Service, moved uh, where the children had to move with her. So I remember that uh, I started my primary school at um, the All Saints Anglican Camp Primary School in Adodo, um, a town in the Adodo at local government of Ogun State. Um, my primary one to and up to primary five uh, was in that school, um, All Saints Anglican Primary School, Adodo in Ogun State. In 1977, my mother was transferred from Adodo to Ogun, I mean to Shagamu, to the Methodist Teacher Training College, and I had to move with her. I was in primary five at that time, so my primary five, the remaining part of my primary five and primary six was spent at the um, local government primary school in Jagba, Shagamu. And uh, after that, I became a student of the Makon High School. Uh, Makon High School is one of the uh, new schools that the UPN government, the Unity Party of Nigeria government, created. Uh, way back in 1980. So I was a second set of that new school, uh, Marko High School in Shagamu. It was in Marko High School that I, I had my class one, class two, and a bit of class three. While I was in the third class, the class three, uh, my mother insisted that I change school to a place where she felt I would be better attended to and I can have access to uh, uh, better monitoring by a friend of hers. So I moved to Mayflower School in Ikene when I was in my third year. And I had the privilege of staying with a teacher. And of course, you know, when you stay with a teacher, 
Ah, God bless your soul. <laughs> so I stayed with a woman, um, a friend of my mother, uh, Mrs. Ogujimi, Mrs. Mosumola Ogujimi. Um, it was the years that I spent with Mrs. Mosumola Ogujimi, a teacher in Mayflower School, um, that really prepared me for uh, service, service. Because as a student of Mayflower, I got involved in several um, activities. I was a member of the Goat Keeping Society. I was a member of the Electrical Society. I was a member of the Plumbing Society. Um, many years later, I got the, the fruits of my years in Mayflower. I remember when I was building my very first house, I was not only the I was not only a bricklayer in that house. I did the plumbing of that house by myself. I did the electrical uh, wiring of that house myself. Courtesy of the things I learned when I was in uh, uh, Mayflower. I remember Dr. Tashilani would tell us that uh, uh, we can do we can do it by ourselves. Uh, so he, 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 Dr. Tashilani would tell us that uh, uh, our roads will be rough. His prayer for us was, may your road uh, be rough. And so when we met rough roads, we learned, uh, we remember what Dr. Taishinani had told us, that our roads will be rough, but uh, we are capable to overcome. So I finished in Mayflower School in 1986. I finished in Mayflower School and uh, I was uh, privileged and honored to be one of the best uh, students in my class. Uh, in actual fact, I was, I was the best student in the arts class because I got the uh, Dr. Taishulani Award for being the best student in the arts class um, in 1986. All right, immediately after my, my secondary education in Mayflower, I got admission to the Ogun State University, Olabisi, now Olabisi Onobanjo University, to study history. Uh, to study history. I would have studied law. But somewhere along the line, I, I lost interest in law. My father wanted me to be a lawyer. So um, during the vacation, during the long vacation, I used to go to the Shagamu High Court to go and see what lawyers were doing and what judges were doing. I wanted to see how lawyers were behaving. As young as I was then, I was just about 15 years old, I hated law courts. I hated the courts. I saw the processes they were going through. The, the lawyer would say something. The judge will say, wait, let me write it. And then the judge will write it. And they will say, wait. And then the, the, the lawyer will talk again. And they'll say, wait. And they will write it again. I say, what? Is this what I was, is this what I was going to get involved with? It was so boring. It was so uneventful to me. So I lost interest in law. So I told my father, I don't want to read law. And of course, my father, being a very liberal person who believed in democratic disposition um, gave me the privilege even at that age to decide what I wanted at that age. I remember my father believed that at the age of 14, an adult has been made. And that's why he, he told us, he said, a fool at 14 is a fool uh, forever. I remember before I was 13, my father kept on singing that song into my ears, a fool at 14, is a fool forever. A fool at 14, is a fool forever. So I made up my mind that by 14, I would not be a fool. And that really helped me a lot. Because by the age of 14, I was already thinking like, like um, um, a 20-year-old. I was already thinking like a 20-year-old. I am a kingdom star. I was called to reign on now. Ministry in the world of life. To the weak to give them strength To the blind to make them see True Christ who strengthened me And so by the time I entered university at a very young age, I was, I was the youngest in the university. I was the youngest in the, in the department. I was the youngest in the faculty. In fact, the youngest of my, the closest of my friend, um, I remember him very vividly, Jimmy Badejo. Jimmy Badejo was 19 years. I was, I, was, I was just climbing, um, I was barely uh, six, I was, I was approaching 16, Jimmy was 19, and he was the next youngest person in the class to me. Um, my, my study of history exposed me to a lot of things. 
my study of history exposed me to a lot of things. And one of the things the study of history exposed me to was hatred for the white man. I hated the white man with a passion. And that rubbed off on my religious life. Because uh, history exposed me to a lot of, a lot of atrocities that um, the white man committed, especially um, slavery, um, the transatlantic slave trade. I read a lot of uh, uh, um, articles, a lot of books on the atrocities committed by the white man against the black race during the, um, during the transatlantic slave trade. So I translated that hatred to Christianity because I believe that Jesus was also a white man. And so um, this the white men that came to, uh, to, to make Africans slaves. So I translated that hatred to Jesus. So I hated Jesus. Um, while I was in the university, I was a part of a press club. And uh, one of the things we did in that press club was to write articles against Christianity. Brilliant articles. Uh, born again, B-U-R-N, born again. I remember I wrote a very powerful article that the whole campus you know, got interested in. I know not Jesus. I know not Jesus. That was the title of my, of my article then. Um, and people got to see this. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, that's good, that's good. They were hailing me for attacking Jesus, you know, not knowing that uh, many years to come, I will serve the same Jesus. I was a member of the Kegas Club. I joined the uh, Pan Wine Drinkers Club. Out of, you know, just wanted to, to, to be happy, just wanted to uh, feel belonging. Uh, so I joined the Pine Wine Drinkers Club, and in the Pine Wine Drinkers Club, I, I learned how to, uh, to drink uh, pine wine laced with um, marijuana, marijuana, uh, because sometimes for the, for the, for the pine wine to shark our tapa, we put uh, um, Igbo marijuana in the, um, in the, in the pine wine so that uh, it will shark us. Uh, very well, and then we'll, our eyes will become uh, as red as possible. So I spent years in the K-Guys Club. But um, a few years, okay, then I also remember that uh, I was not only into K-Guys Club, I was also uh, into some form of uh, rascal behavior. I remember I used to, I used to wear braids. I would go to salon, I would go to um, hairdressing salon where I would braid my ear, I remember my nickname on campus was Oparaji. Oparaji. Um, that was uh, that was 1988, the year um, that great footballer Sam Oparaji reigned. Um, that same year, I remember that same year he died. But just before he died, you know, he had reigned so much that um, everybody knew Oparaji. So I had the same kind of dreadlocks, the same kind of hairstyle of uh, Sam Oparaji. So. Um, I became a toast of the campus, so everybody was calling me Okwaraji, Okwaraji, Okwaraji. Till today, some of my colleagues have forgotten my names. They still, re they still refer to me as uh, Okwaraji <laughs> in, uh, in, in remembrance of the kind of hairstyle I was putting on at that time. Uh, but one of the things that happened to me that prepared me for my salvation experience was my, de my, my decagation. I am a kingdom star. I was called to reign on now. Ministry in the world of life. To the weak to give them strength. To the blind to make them see. Through Christ who strengthened me. In the K Guys Club, I was decaged from the K Guys Club on the last, um, on, during my final year. Uh, we're having a gyration on campus. And um, being, you know, who, who I was, I was, I was a provost marshal of the uh, of the Ilia do here. That's the Ilia that I belonged to at that time, Ilia Meleki. I was the provost marshal of Ilia Meleki. And uh, during one of the generations, during the last generation of the coronation of the next king, the next chief of the Kegai's Club in that year, um, one of the chiefs was vibrating. 
I remember vividly one of the chiefs, the Kega chiefs, was vibrating. I think the um, the the ex um, AB national, the AB national was vibrating. AB national is the referring to the chief from the University of Ibadan. Ibadan is Ilia Ilia du national. So it was vibrating. And I was, uh, I was giving adjusters. I was giving some adjusters. And at the point, he got annoyed. Of course, I was tipsy, I was taking some palm wine. So I was tipsy. At the point, the Kegat chief was annoyed. And he looked into my direction and he said, Provost Masha, Ilya, do, uh, Ilya Meleki, no keke must care. And I replied him, I said, what head? You know, with that uh, tipsy nature. And then he said, no keke must care. No keke must care means silence. And I still went ahead and still replied to him, you know, with anger. And then, you know, out of that anger, he brought out a calabash. And uh, right in my presence, he broke the calabash. And breaking the calabash in Kegas Club means that uh, you do not belong to that association. So I was decanked. I was sent out of the Kegas Club because of my unruly behavior uh, to one of the chiefs at the gyration. But that was good for me. Because it, uh, it set me on the path of uh, retrospective thinking. So I got, I got annoyed. I left the Kegai's Club. And so I never went back there to drink palm wine or to get involved in their activities again. But that was just a semester. Immediately after my uh, graduation from Obafemi, I mean from uh, Ogun State University, I proceeded to Ondo State for my youth service. I was disappointed I was posted to those states because uh, I wanted adventure. I just wanted to, to fly around. So I was looking forward to being posted to somewhere in the north. Uh, either Katsina, uh, no, Katsina never existed at that time. Uh, Kaduna, Kano. Uh, at best, I thought maybe they would post me to uh, Plateau State. So I was looking for that because I've been to Plateau State um, once as a member of the Man War. I, I went with a delegation of Manowar to Shere Hills in Joss. So I loved, that was when I was in my part three. So I loved Joss. So I thought I would be posted to uh, the north. But unfortunately, I was posted to southwest on those states. I didn't, I didn't bargain for southwest, but I was posted to southwest. So I went. And uh, of course, I got to camp and uh, the usual behavior argue with Christians. I could argue. I could argue. My experience in history helped a lot. We argued with Christians. Uh, and it's always about Jesus. Argument was always about Jesus. And can I tell you, I always win. I win those arguments all of the time. That anytime we argue about Christianity and Jesus, the Christians on, on that camp will, will eventually have to bow. Because I will prove to them that Jesus was a white man and that Jesus was not the son of God and that Jesus went to India to learn magic. And that it was when he came back. Because I will ask them, between the age of 12 and the age of 30, 30 where was Jesus? They couldn't explain. Where Jesus went between the age of, age of 12 and the age of 30? And I tell them, I will tell them, Jesus went to India. He went to learn magic. Magic. So it was the magic that Jesus went and learned in India that he came to practice and they say he's doing miracle. That it was not, he was not really doing miracle. He was doing India, he was doing magic that he learned from India. I am a kingdom star. I was called to reign on now. Ministry in the world of life. To the weak to give them strength. To the blind to make them see. Through Christ who strengthened me. Many at times they will just look at me. But I cannot forget one of my colleagues in the NYC camp. He made a comment. Because when we're living, we gave ourselves books. You know, you know, we're writing comments, autographs, and all of that. So he wrote in my own autograph, he wrote there, he said, Shegu, a chronic unbeliever. But backed by the power of the Holy Spirit, he will preach the gospel. When I read his comment, I laughed and laughed and laughed. Me preach the gospel over my dead body. But the words were written. And I, when I got born again, I went back to the words that John, his name was John, 
brother John. He was one of the Christians on my, in my platoon, platoon three. Shegu, a chronic unbeliever, but backed by the power of the Holy Spirit, will preach the gospel. Those words were prophetic. And it, the Holy Spirit actually backed it up. Because immediately after my youth service, my youth service was, was rough. Was rough. Rough because, you know, um, I, I had some, you know, um, uh, you, you know, when you are stubborn, you are stubborn. <laughs> so I had some rough experiences with my employers. And each time I had a problem with the employer, I would seek for um, redeployment. So I actually served in about seven places, receiving deployment here. Some will reject me. In other places, I will get deployment. But the last place I was, I was, I, I served. My head started uh, cooling, cooling down. I served last at Tangling Kang Grammar School in Igbara. Okay, I did my best. Taught the students. Yeah, in terms of hard work, yes hard work in terms of brilliance yes brilliant i was brilliant and i could you know innovate brings all kinds of innovation but i i just hated oppression i hated oppression of any sort so when 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 we we're leaving that school something dramatic happened the the principal did certain things that we the coppers we didn't like and so we vowed that we we're going to deal with the principal so on the last day the school organized a sent forth for us and then we didn't attend. We refused to attend the sent forth. So they gave us some gifts, uh, glass cups, glass plates, and all of that. So they sent it to our coppers lodge. That's okay. You guys didn't come. This is the gift the school presented. So I convinced all the other coppers that we will break those uh, plates and cups at the door of the principal office. So I. We carried ourselves and we went to the door of the principal and we broke all the cups, all the plates. We broke everything at the door of the principal and said, to hell uh, with you. The following day, we left the campus, the school, compound. And I wrote down the name of the principal. I wrote his name in a book. When I become rich, I will deal with him. I listed about, about 20 names of people who offended me while I was doing my youth service, that when I become rich, I will deal with all of them. Uh, many years later, after I got born again, I stumbled on that list. I smiled, I smiled. With my own hands, I, sh I lighted uh, matches and I burnt, I burnt that list. After my youth service, I, 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 I got back home and my first intention was to, to go look for a job. I loved the police. I loved the police. So I, I actually wanted to be a policeman. I wanted to be a policeman. That love for police still is still very much in me. And that explains why a few years ago I went for a spy police training. And today I'm a spy policeman. Now that love for the police was there when I finished my first degree. So after my first degree, I, I, I applied to join the police. And I got the cadet, ASP cadet forms. And um, everything was intact. Everything was intact. The police commissioner had gotten a letter from my father, got a letter from the traditional ruler, the Akaribu of Remoland, got a letter from uh, one or two places, very high places, that this is our candidate from Shagamu, and um, nothing should tamper with his uh, candidature. So the coast was clear for me to join the police as an ASP cadet. As if God was watching me, I don't know what happened. On the day I was to, so, supposed to go for the interview, those were not the days of uh, uh, internet, where you get all kinds of information as quickly as possible. I was playing table tennis in front of my house, and one of my friends alighted from the taxi, and I said, where are you coming from? He said he went for ASP interview. And here was I playing table tennis. I didn't know. I didn't get information that the ASP interview was going to hold that day. So I missed it. And you have to wait another one year for it for you to attend that interview. So I said, I'd rather wait. Instead of waiting for one year, I'd rather go for my master's. And that exactly was where God was waiting for me. So I went for my master's 
e no ba fe me wo I am a kingdom star. I was called to reign on now. Ministry in the world of life. To the weak to give them strength. To the blind to make them see. Through Christ and strength in me. Precisely three months after I got into campus as a postgraduate student of Obafemi Aulo University, I met with Christ. Very dramatic. As a student on campus, um, I believe in gyrating, I believe in jumping around. The Keg Guys Club was no go area because I had been de um, in the um, at, 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 at my undergraduate, on my final year, I had been de so it was no go area for me. So there was there was a need to go and gyrate elsewhere. So the next point of gyration was jambites. Run after jambites. So there was this particular jambite I was running after. Incidentally, she came from my uh, from my town. I knew her from my town, and so now she's a jambite. Uh, so I felt, oh, this is the next. Uh, this is a good one. This is a good fish to to catch. So I started running after her. And I, were, I was taking her out, going her, taking her back to the campus. Somehow along the line, she got born again. Somebody preached to her and she got born again. And less than a week after she got born again, she felt that I should be the next person uh, she should preach the gospel to. So she came to my room. On that faithful day, I won't, I won't forget, um, precisely on the 9th of March, 9th of March, 1992. She walked into my room. She sat down with me. My roommate was listening. And she was preaching. She was talking to me about Jesus. And I remember she spoke for less than seven minutes. And I started crying. I knew she was not the one talking. Something was heavy on her. And so she, she told me about Jesus. And she asked me whether I would give my life to Christ. Tearfully, I knelt before her and she led me to Christ. My roommate was like, is, <laughs> is she going crazy? I know she was, he was toasting this, this lady. How come the lady she's toasting is now asking him to kneel down so that he could pray for her? I too could not understand. After the lady left my room, I was like, what, what just happened? What did I just do? But I knew something had happened to me. I couldn't explain it, but I was still wondering what happened, what happened. But right there, I knew I had a, I had a divine encounter. Now, I didn't know what it takes to give one's life to Christ. But I knew that people go out for altar call. I've seen altar calls, altar calls. So, in my heart, I thought, if you don't answer altar call, you are not yet born again. So for the next three days, I started looking for programs so that I can go and answer altar call. I didn't know that the moment I knelt down, I prayed that prayer, I was already born again. So for three days, I was looking out. Is there any program? Is there any program on campus? Fortunately, Daddy Adeboye was coming. They announced that Pastor Adeboye was coming to Sports Center in OAU. So I said, fine, I'm going to go and give my life to Jesus during this program. So I went to that program. Pastor Adeboye preached. Before man and God, I can't remember what Pastor Adeboye said because I was not even listening. I was not interested in what he was saying. I was just interested in altar, altar call. As he was preaching, I was just saying, Pastor, make altar call. <laughs> make altar call. So when he made the altar call, I was one of the first set of people to step out. So I stepped out and, you know, he led us in prayer. I gave my life to Christ officially. I, so I thought that is how to give my life to Christ. So, and that was the beginning of um, a turnaround in my entire life. That was the beginning of the turnaround in my life. On that day, 11th of March, 1992, I now officially gave my life to to Christ officially gave my life to Christ on the 11th of March, uh, 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 1992. Unofficially, on the 9th of March, officially on the 11th of March, officially because I went to answer <laughs> altar call. So, fortunately for me, 
during the counseling session, I got uh, the privilege of being counseled by one of the vibrant fellowships on campus. Um, usually during such programs on campus, uh, fellowships will distribute their counselors and follow up, uh, follow up, uh, uh, follow up workers. So I was followed up by a member of the Christ Ambassadors Student Outreach, CASO. CASO is the student arm of the Assemblies of God Church. Another, another coincidence, another divine arrangement. Let me not call it coincidence. So I joined CASO, Assemblies of God um, Campus Ham, and um, I began to grow. On a particular day in one of the fellowships on campus, uh, our president requested that we should all go out for evangelism. And man, I was, I was, I was testy. I was testy to share my body, to share what I, uh, what I have received with other people. I was angry with myself that, yes, for, for four years as a student on campus, as an undergraduate, I never knew about Jesus. I, went, I, I, I attended a couple of fellowships, but I went to fellowships on campus if there was going to be food or drinks. You know, and usually when we go to such fellowship, we will time our attendance, myself and my friends, Jimmy, Demola, and all of that. We will time our going to that fellowship to the time when they will serve refreshments. So we will enter just about the time that they, they want to start serving. And immediately after refreshment, we will take our leave. And if the usher says, bro, stay now, we will tell the usher, get out. To hell with you. They will say some dirty languages and the ushers will say, okay, 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 okay. So they will allow us to go after we have eaten their food. And when we get there, we say, stupid people. They thought they can arrest us with their food. We have eaten their food and we are disappearing. So we'll go out and then, and then we'll make mockery of them. So I joined that fellowship, Castle. So my president, the president of the fellowship requested that we go out for evangelism. With joy in my heart, I joined the team. Unknown to me, I was the only non-ESCO, non-worker to participate in that outing. So the following Sunday, it was on a Saturday, we went for evangelism on Saturday. So the following Sunday, the president of the fellowship, um, Pastor Joe Alao, Dr. Joe Alao, now Bishop Jonathan Alao, said, is there any member who followed us for evangelism who is not a worker? Who is not an ESCO? Ah, I'm not a worker. I'm not an ESCO. But I know I went out for evangelism. So I lifted up my hands, expecting that several other people would lift up their hands. And I lifted up my hands. I think I was the only person lifting up. So I wanted to quickly draw down the hands. You know, I said, ah, come, 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 come. God bless you. So he brought me out and he praised me. He gave me uh, a copy of a Bible. He gave me a Bible. And then he prayed for me. And wow, that touched me. He, God bless Bishop Jonathan Alao. He never knew what he did on that day. That he sowed a seed of, you know, God's work, service into my life. He never knew. So I got interested. I was fully, fully interested. Six months after, six months after I became born again, I became a missionary. I became a missionary. In the history of the fellowship, it was one of the fastest uh, growth they ever they ever thought about that somebody could become a missionary. The fellowship president requested that there's a need for student missionaries to go for uh, mission work in a church, one of the churches in town, and they needed uh, missionaries. So I stepped forward. I said, I'm ready to go. And so they, they, they prayed for me, and then I became a missionary to that church. And then that was the church where I eventually got to meet my wife, got to be introduced to the ministry, got to introduced to the Man Zion Faith Ministries International. In that church, I met a sister who had attended the Man Zion Institute, and she told me a lot of things about the Man Zion Institute. And uh, that sister is Sister Lara, Lara Adebayo, who is uh, wife of uh, Bro Adebayo, a member of Man Zion. She later joined the ministry. She was a member of my church at that time. So she told me about Man Zion, uh, because she saw that I was interested in drama, so I agreed that I would attend the Manzan Institute. And of course, because of that uh, sense of pride, I was a member of the NYC drama troupe. 
and uh, I have I have I have learned some bit of drama while I was doing English because I majored in history in my first degree. I minored in English, so I had some courses in literature. I had some courses in drama and all of that. So while I was going to the Manzan Institute, I was asking myself, what do they know about drama? What do they know about drama? I will teach them when I get there. When they see when they see the stuff I made of, they will appoint me a lecturer. <laughs> that was the kind of understanding. But when I got to Mazan Institute, I was humbled. My pride deflated. My ego was reduced to zero. Because what they were saying was completely not related to what I thought at all. So for the first three days I was in the Mazan Institute, I was weeping. I was weeping. All I was hearing was God, service to God, we, we, we had messages from Rena Bonke, blood washed Africa. We had messages from Evangelist Mike Bamiloe, how God depends on us. Ah, this is not drama. This is, this is more than drama. So it changed my orientation. By the time I was leaving Mount Zion, I left with a body, a body for ministry. I was already wrapping up my master's at that time, 1993, 1990. Yeah, that was, that was 1993. I was already wrapping up my master's, November 1993, October 93. By November, I came back for the ACP. It became another thing entirely. By the time I came for the ACP, I'd already made up my mind. I was going to serve the Lord. I was going to serve the Lord. And I was going into full time to serve the Lord in the drama ministry. But I had a problem. My master's was almost wrapping up. I had a master's in international relations. And since my dream of going into the police did not work, my next dream was the diplomatic corps. I wanted to join the Nigerian diplomatic corps. So, um, and all through the years I was in, I was, I was doing my, my, uh, my second degree, my master's, I pictured myself in the Nigerian diplomatic corps. I pictured myself representing Nigeria in the in the in the United Nations representing Nigeria in WHO representing Nigeria in uh, OAU and you know all sorts so that was a big challenge for me to decide whether to uh, to go for ministry or to go for uh, the diplomatic corps but God helped me I eventually took a decision took a decision that I will I will serve the Lord and one of the things that helped me to take a decision was my wife, my fiancée. I met her when I was in the Assemblies of God Church. And uh, we were together in a young drama group we formed, the Watchtower um, Evangelical Drama Group. So I was, I was, I was, I was, I had proposed to her, that was in 1994. I had made a proposal to her and she said, let me pray. Let me take a decision whether to marry you or not to marry you. So I told her that I was going to Port Harcourt. I was going to get a job uh, in Port Harcourt in the oil company. That is either I get a job in the oil company or I get a job in the diplomatic corps. So she looked at herself and said, what God told her was that she will marry an evangelist, not somebody working in the oil company or in the diplomatic corps. So she told God, if you want this man to be my husband, convince him to serve you. So when eventually... I had a decision to serve the Lord. I told her I was ready to serve the Lord. I was not going to put her court again, and I was not going to seek for a job in the diplomatic corps again. And that was a conviction for her. And she later told me her conviction, and so she agreed to marry me. To marry me, and that was in 1994. Praise God, we got married December, uh, January 20, 1996. I am a kingdom star. I was called to reign on now. Ministry in the world of life To the weak to give them strength To the blind to make them see Through Christ who strengthened me I am something, I am a light A royal priest to the holy nation Hear of God, so call me kingdom of I am something, I am a light A royal priest to the holy nation and here of God, so call me kingdom star. He has 
Promise me to be my shield, a dwelling place and my help. I will wait on him till the end and carry his glory everywhere. Yes, promise me to be my shield, a dwelling place and my help. I will wait on him till the end and carry his glory everywhere.